Hi, my name is Anthony Boyko, and I will be talking about the remaining four papers in the Vision Transformers lecture um, that my partner Niusha started talking about. Um, the first being Emerging Properties and Self-Supervised Vision Transformers. Um, it focuses on self-distillation with no labels, also called DINO. That is the proposed model in this paper. Um, it is a self-supervised approach to vision transformers, and it builds upon uh, DIT, or DEIT, and highlights the success of K-nearest neighbors without additional fine-tuning. comes with a few stipulations. It needs a momentum encoder and multi-crop multi augmentation. I'll discuss about those later in the presentation. Self-distillation with no enables. What is it? Um, so I'm going to first start by just giving a very brief overview from of what it is, and then I'll, as I'll go on, it'll be more and more in depth. So imagine an input image X. Um, we're gonna generate a pair of, ran of views, uh, X1 and X2. So these are some random transformation. Imagine we rotate the image, um, crop it, blur it, things of that nature. Um, we're gonna input them into the network G beta. Uh, in this case, the diagram is showing where there's one student and one teacher. Um, denoted by the S and T respectively, but you could have more students. We're going to make a prediction as shown by the softmax, and then we're going to use the probabilities to calculate the loss, where the loss function is just um, the cross entropy. And then we update the weights. Um, a few things that you'll notice here is the teacher is influenced by this exponential moving average by the students. I'll explain the purpose of that later, and that's what EMA stands for. Um, exponential moving average. There's a centering operation, stop dimension collapse in the teacher network. Um, and then also because we don't really want um, the teacher to be learning from this, from its prediction, we have this stop gradient. So its values don't update. So first we'll go over the network cost function. Like what are we actually trying to accomplish here? Well, um, we're given a global set of views X and a local set of views X1, or X prime, sorry. We wish to minimize the cross entropy loss, which is denoted by L under uh, subscript CE. This multi-crop uh, component of the architecture um, has the author uses, or this is the multi-crop component of the architecture. The author uses two global views at um, 224 squared and 96 squared pixels respectively. So these are a small and a large image. Uh, global views are large parts of the original image. Imagine something greater than 50%, and local views are small patches. Um, we want to minimize the two views, or minimize the loss between the two views using this cross-entropy loss. So between the global view and the local view. So that's what the what you're trying to minimize the difference between. Um, and you can see the first summation is all of the local views within the set, and the local views do not equal the global views. And then you go over all of the different global views. Unlike knowledge distillation, there's no priory for the teacher. Um, so this is where we solve this by using previous iterations from the students to make um, that priority. And this is the momentum encoder. Um, the uh, exponential moving average is how this momentum encoder works. And it's based on these previous iterations on how the teacher network updates its weights. Um, because when you reinitialize the model, both networks are going to be started at like random weights. And so how do we update the teacher if we have no basis? We do that based on the student. And then the, the students will learn from now this updated teacher. Um, so the value of this is some parameter lambda, which is just basically how much are we keeping from the original teacher network, and then um, the inverse of that um, value between 0 and 1 is going to be how much do the students influence the teacher. Basically, how much are they, um, their moving average is going to influence the teacher. Um, so I talked about avoiding collapse earlier with the centering. Um, basically what this is, is the model can experience dimension reduction if we train it too much. 
And then if that happens, the, it stops being a useful predictor because that means you've lost some sort of variable um, when you're uh, in your output. And so how do the authors avoid this? Well, they use two operations. Um, if you use them individually, you'll see they actually can cause the dimension um, collapse to expedite. So they, it's basically a balancing act between the two, depending on your data set. You use the centering operation uh, to adjust the update rule for the teacher network to be dependent on the mean of each batch. Basically, what this means is each batch in training will have less variance because it's influenced by the mean of all values. So you will see it uh, like you'll see the difference between batches is less. And so that means each update will have be less likely to be affected by outliers. However, this means you can have the uh, training collapse to some uniform distribution because eventually like that gap will shrink. So there's this sharpening, which is this edge enhancement and it has the opposite effect. And it's accomplished by using a low temperature in the soft maximization, basically making the difference when the probabilities are in the soft max more pronounced because we've added in some sort of value there. Um, and if you see the, the values below here are the centering formulas. So we have some teacher network and then we're just adding some bias, bias term, which is the centering value. And then the centering value is calculated by um, some parameter that adjusts based on the the batch values, which is that that parameter M is how much the batch influences. So we've talked a lot about how does this, what's the goal of what this model is trying to accomplish? Well, what is it actually using? Um, so the architecture for it is it takes the input images, it feeds this into a vision transformer or a ResNet backbone, and then it goes through a projection head. And the projection head is a three-layer, multi-layer perceptron, um, which is then used, fed into an L2 norm, which is the function is very similar to Pythagoras, where you're just taking like the square root of each of the components to get the distance. And then you have the fully connected layer, which you use then to make your output. So now we'll go into some uh, experiments that they ran. First, they compared it on ImageNet, which um, they wanted to see both in the linear and the k-nearest neighbor evaluation. Um, they did it on both ResNet 50 and Vision Transformer architectures. Um, and you can see that uh, Dino performs the best in all different areas. Um, uh, and also, you'll see in when they're comparing the supervised methods, they only did it on the small vision transformers. So on those tests, like you could see a better result given the larger uh, architecture sizes. Um, another thing you can see here too is there's a lot less parameters for Dino when you're comparing with these bigger vision transformers. Um, like uh, even at the largest Dino size with the big uh, eight size patches um, and even the 16 size, you'll see 85 parameters um, and then 312 and 63 images. Um, and as you'll see later in the experiments, uh, the smaller patch sizes are better. Um, the only surprising thing is the K nearest neighbors doesn't actually perform the best on the biggest vision transformer network. For some reason, it performs better on the smallest one. Um, and so now they also compare the self-supervised learning on four different tasks on ImageNet, being image retrieval, copy detection, video instance segmentation, and transfer learning. Image retrieval is evaluated on ImageNet and Google Landmarks V2. Uh, data set and how they measure success is through the mean average precision and it's based on revisited Oxford and Paris as the two locations. Um, the M and H here refer to uh, the severity of the split, so both medium and hard splits, uh, which is just inherent to the data set. Um, 
one thing I find a little weird about this experiment is all the other ones are trained on ImageNet, uh, where the best performing one is trained on a different data set being this Google Landmarks. So even though with the Google Landmarks, Dino performs the best, I don't necessarily think it's a, com a fair comparison against this R101 um, plus R Mac architecture because they're not being pre-trained on the same data source. So it doesn't necessarily say that Dino is performing better. Um, next is the copy detection. Evaluation is on the strong subset of INRA copies data set. The goal is detecting images that have been distorted. Basically, how I said earlier, we do, um, we create these views where you can do various effects of them. So the goal of this is to see has one of those um, artificial augmentations occurred. Uh, so they, they train this on 10K distractor images that are randomly sampled from the data set described on the slide. And the copy detection uses cosine similarity on the features. And that's how they're ranking the precision there. Um, 20K images were learned to use the features. So what they mean by this is they, they fine tune the model or they train the model on the, the 20,000 images and then they augmented 10,000 of them. Um, and then they check to see if it could detect those 10,000. Um, you'll see Dino does perform the best um, at a smaller dimension size and um, even at a smaller resolution. Um, so that means, which is a pretty big improvement because the bigger resolution, I mean, there's more pixels uh, that the model has to work with and you can see granularity differences better. Um, so next is video instance segmentation. Uh, basically, we're trying to track features on video files. Um, like imagine we're driving on a road and we want to see the part that's drivable. Uh, so this is what the goal of this task would be. It's to like basically as the video goes along, um, maintain the different classes, whether it's like the, the drivable part of a road in a car through a camera or um, separating like uh, an animal in a video as it's flying or something. Um, it's trained on ImageNet and they use two different metrics for this one. There's the mean region similarity and then there's the contour. Uh, so the contour would be kind of like your lines and then the mean region would be just like the overall area. So one's like edges and one's the area. Um, and as you can see on the right there, they have one where they're both comparing both of them, like the average between the two, um, and then them independently. And uh, Dino does the best out of the ImageNet ones. However, there was a different data set that performed significantly better. So um, maybe they should have tried this on that data set as well. But on ImageNet, Dino does perform the best. Um, so here's some examples of this video exit instance segmentation. If you want to see like more qualitative results, um, you can see like the red area is the segmented object. And then um, in the supervised approach, you can see more little red dots, especially in the group of ducks in the image where it's not actually the ducks that it's trying to segment. Um, and basically what the segmentation is, is it's a mask obtained. So we're trying to uh, like, uh, if you imagine a matrix, um, highlight the points where the object uh, is in that particular class. And the threshold for this is 60%, and it's based upon the self-attention maps in the transformer. Um, the comparison similarity is using the, sorry, the comparison is using the Jacquard similarity um, from images on Pascal uh, VOC12 data set and Dino performed significantly better than the compared against models, where the compared against models were almost the same as random. 
Um, the next task is transfer learning. So Dino uh, versus the uh, supervised approach when evaluating transfer learning. Um, it outperforms performs in almost every data set for both networks. Uh, the difference is very small. So like most of these are fairly marginal improvements other than like maybe the ImageNet one, but it's still an improvement nonetheless. So the Appalachian study of Dino is basically we're trying to see what parts of the model in Dino are actually more beneficial than others. Uh, we First, we noticed that small patch sizes show better performance. Um, however, the cost is significantly slower. So the 16 by 16 patches will perform worse than the 8 by 8s, um, given that, but it obviously will be slower because if, if there are only 8 by 8 patches, that means there's more tokens for the model to learn. And you can see that by the throughput versus the performance increase. Um, where the increased benefit is more pronounced is on the uh, DEIT transformer, going from 16 to 8 has multiple percentage points increase. Where on uh, vision transformers, it was it's closer to 1. Um, next, it's highlighting on basically what features in Dino uh, affect the performance in the various uh, compared to the default settings. Um, so for instance, the sync horn knob has minimal effect. Um, if we include that setting um, compared to the base model, there is uh, a 0.6% difference to the K-nearest neighbors and a 0.1% difference on uh, the linear. However, uh, if we don't have the momentum encoder, the accuracy goes to zero. So obviously this thing's crucial. Um, next, the multi-crop, you see about a 5% or yeah, four to 5%, depending if you're looking at k nearest neighbor, linear uh, decrease on each of them respectively. And similarly, if you go to uh, mean squared error instead of cross entropy, you see a significant uh, decrease. Um, next, we're going to talk about mask autoencoders or scalable vision learners. So this paper introduces an asymmetric encoder decoder architecture, um, which what I mean by this is the encoder uses a subset of the data set and the decoder uses encoded data plus learned component to represent the rest of the input image. Um, it shows masking a high proportion of the input image to be meaningful self-supervised test. What I mean by this is um, learning um, like a uh, mask through a large part of the image is just a good predictor uh, when it comes to vision learning. And using mask autoencoders, uh, the training speeds increase from 2.8 to 4.1 um, times respect, depending on the input parameters of the model. Um, so first we'll talk about what is a mask. Well, I kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but it's a matrix used to determine which parts of the input image to use. So if on the left-hand side, we had this cheetah, all the parts that are colored are the parts of the image we want to use that um, in the mask. And then everything else is represented by zeros in the gray section. And then what the goal of the mask is to do is it's to try and rebuild that image. So that's the middle, it's like, that's the rebuild what the model would predict given the initial input image on the right. Um, so if we know we know what a mask is, well, what kind of strategies are important here? Like, as you can see here, there's random, there's block, there's grid, um, which ones perform better? What about different sizes? Like what if I only mask 25% of the image, 50, 75%? Uh, do these different ratios affect performance? Um, and But you can see here, uh, when you look at the random, that it performs the best out of them. Because like if you look at the grid, although the parts where the grid is um, didn't mask things, it's very clear. You have this grid-like block pattern all over where there's a clear distinction on um, the mask didn't perform too well. And then the block, you see a similar, like just huge parts of blurring 
where it just didn't have any information anywhere nearby. So it just like does, it can't predict that pixel very well. Where the random, um, although certain aspects may be slightly worse, overall it's a better image. Um, so now, what is a mask autoencoder? Well, um, we're going to start the simple approach, like as we did on the last paper, and we'll slowly expand upon it, making it um, more complex on how we describe it. So first, we're going to take the input image, um, we're going to ignore a portion of the input, i.e. the masking, and then we feed into the encoder um, that remaining data. Then we add some additional features. So this is the positional data. So this is the features we're trying to learn to, so when the, the decoder can recreate the image. Um, and then once we've decoded the image, we use that data to reconstruct. Uh, we use the decoded data to reconstruct the image. So on this figure on the right, we have some mass data. We only include this mass data. These blue parts represent the mist where the mask was, um, or like the positional data for these input images. And then everything else is the gray squares are what we're trying to learn in the decoder. Um, and then we reconstruct the image through that decoded data. So more formally, we approach this is we define the input into a series of patches. So those are the grids. We sample a subset of those patches and mask the rest. So each of those patches were the grids on the previous square, um, the mask encoder, it uses a vision transformer to take the unmasked patches as inputs. Um, we embed the unmasked patches, and then we process this using a series of transformer blocks, which I'll explain more about later. Um, the decoder is both these encoded visible patches and a set of mask tokens. These mask tokens are a shared learned feature vector, representing each of the missing patches. The reconstruction target here is uh, the decoder's output that is reshaped to form the reconstructed image. And we measure the loss of this of the mean squared error between the predicted and the original image. So the abolition study is, once again, what is important in the model. Um, so there's two different things that they're comparing against. It's a fine-tuned and a linear probed um, of part of the encoder. Um, so, and the first part is saying like, okay, how many uh, blocks should we do? Um, and you can see there's a middle ground, like you don't want to go too far, um, where both models perform, both uh, fine tuning and linear perform best at eight. Um, and then the width uh, is just how wide is the feature vector. Um, I'm guessing this also has to do more with the input image size. Um, it performs better at the 512. And then is the is encoding with mask tokens or without better? Um, and you can see, uh, and so the flops is how much like how much complexity it adds. Um, if we don't include the mask token, so basically we only encode the parts that uh, are meaningful inputs from the image, we see, see a significant increase in the linear probing performance and a slight increase in the fine tuning, but it's 3.3 times less operations that have to be processed. So it's a significant increase in speed. Where the reconstruction target, you see, um, Pixel with normalization performs better than PCA or uh, the token approach. Um, and data augmentation, the cropped and random size performs better than cropped fixed size or, uh, yeah. And mass sampling. So this is the difference with the ratios and uh, what kind of strategy, and here random with 75% mask perform the best. Uh, now here's the comparison to the models. Um, so they can, you can see here it compares better against Dino, um, and even also this uh, BEIT when it's also fine-tuned on another data set as well, not just the in the 
ImageNet 1K. Um, and it performs better at all sizes. And then, yeah. Uh, so the, the another key thing you'll see here is um, the big, big, big 16, the large 16, and uh, huge 16 uh, are the models. And so they just represent the size of the, the model and also the patch size. Um, and then the their images are all 224 by 224, except for the Vision Transformer Huge is uh, 448 by 448. Or you're the one that has the subscript of that. Right. Next, so and this is another key uh, experiment. It's basically, um, rather than just linear probing or full fine tuning. They want to try and do a mid uh, a mid ground between the two, um, which is this like to, to say, um, can we uh, train a portion of the model, like uh, that being some of the transformer blocks and improve the results rather than training all of them? Where, and the, you want to do this, because, the idea behind this is because linear probing does not capture um, Nonlinear features because it's a linear method, but it, but it's very good at uh, linear features. Um, where the fine tuning and the deep learning approach can capture these nonlinear features. So, if we know our data set does have these nonlinear features, we can fine tune some of the transformer blocks, um, and the order of them is specific. Um, they did the authors in this paper did train specific transformer blocks in an order um, rather than just starting from first to end because not all of them have the same benefit. Um, but you can see uh, that it does make a meaningful difference when we're training um, four to six, you can see a significant improvement um, as opposed to zero. And going from 18 to 24, you don't really see much improvement even from 12. Um, so that can also like speed up your model significantly if you only partially fine tune it. Next is the transfer learning. Uh, it's a common task in um, any machine learning. If we train something once, can we uh, transfer it to a different task, that uh, learned component? Um, so the mask autoencoder performs better than all of the other papers. Um, and on all the other data sets, uh, unsurprisingly, the biggest uh, model performs better. Uh, here, they also compare against using pixels or tokens as the reconstruction target. And the difference between them is represented at the bottom through this uh, the delta. You can see there really isn't much of a difference between them. Uh, whether you're using the token or the normalized pixel. So the next paper is Metaformer is actually what you need for vision. It proposes a generalized architecture for transformers that don't use attention, demonstrates that even a simple token mixer such as pooling can produce competitive results in computer vision tasks. Um, Metaformer, so we're gonna talk about just in a brief idea what the Metaformer is and um, its model, and then we'll go into it more in depth. So Metaformer is an abstracted architecture. It's derived from transformers. And the idea here is we remove attention from transformers and uh, where intent, intention is the uh, token mixer, let's say Metaformer just uses some, some generalized token mixer and then your specific implementation can use whatever you want. And the authors uh, show that Metaformer, that, so the like ordering of how you have these blocks is more important by using this uh, architecture called pool former, where instead of the more complicated attention task, they're, or, yeah, they're using this pooling um, block to uh, connect the, instead. And so first we'll talk about what is pool former. Uh, sorry, we'll go back here. Um, we'll explain what these things are. So to refresh you, um, 
on these what these transformer blocks are is you have some input embedding and then you uh, feed that in with the normalization through the token mixer. So the token mixer affects what the input embedding does and like how much it influences the model. It goes through another normalization and then also through the multi-layer perceptron and it creates the input. So this is what a pool former um, block looks like. Um, like first we'll talk about the pool former block. It's that uh, normalization, the pooling, and then the normalization, the channel MLP. Um, so first we have the input image, let's say is this cat. Um, the three is just the different channels, red, green, blue, uh, the height and width of the image. We embed the image, and then the first stage is we downsample it by four. Um, this stage uses a ratio of six, uh, a sixth of the total number of blocks in the architecture. So in these transformer architectures, we can have increasingly large number of blocks. And this is basically just saying the ratio of it is one sixth of that number. Um, then at the second, then we go through another patch embedding. We uh, downsize it in half again, um, using also a sixth of the pool former blocks. And then we downsize it again um, after embedding it in half. And this time we use half of the total number of blocks. And then we embed and then do a sixth. And then we create our output. Um, but yeah, the key thing to note here is the ratio of the pool former blocks. So let's say we had um, our first architecture, the smallest size was six. Uh, stage one, two, and four would each have one, one block. And then stage three would have three blocks. Um, so the results, this was on... Uh, image classification, object detection, instance segmentation, and semantic segmentation uh, for the three tasks. Um, here, there's just a bunch of different architectures, and um, they represent uh, different um, types of things that they're comparing against. So, for instance, pool formers proposed um, any multi-layer perceptron one, which is going to be is done through for spatial MLP. So that's the si uh, the right sided triangle. And then the upwards facing one are your attention based token mixers. And then the downward one is a ResNet. So they're comparing against different types of token mixers and the pooling performs better than all of them, even though it's a very simple operation. Um, and also this uh, max is number of like actual um uh like actual computing operations it has to do and it also performs better accuracy at lower number for across all comparisons where even smaller model sizes is the left hand uh, object detection and instant segmentation um so this is just comparing against different sized bounding boxes and um uh, different masking ratios, so it's the small, medium, large objects, and then the bounding box is the percentage um, threshold. Um, pool former performs better than the ResNet comparison, um, whether it's the mask or it's on ResNet that it's trained on. Uh, and it also has less parameters other than at the smallest size, which is consistent with the other um, experiments. Uh, the segmentic segmentation. Um, it's done on 20K images for training and 2K images for validation. Um, it's compared against both ResNet and attention-based um, architectures. And it performs better than all of them and at a smaller parameter size. And the, the target metric here is the mean um, intersection over union. Um, so the avalation study is, so this is saying like, okay, um, what parts of this generalized uh, thing are better? Because we're talking about metaformers. We're trying to see, can we generalize transformers? Um, 
and show that it isn't just a tension. Um, so by adjusting the pooling size, uh, you can see there's slight differences in performance, but not majorly. But going to a depth-wise convolution, um, you see a larger increase in performance, um, with similar uh, requirements in computation. Um, and then another thing you see is uh, going for normalization. If you have no normalization, you perform significantly worse. Difference between batch and layer is very small, um, but this modified layer normalization is the best. Uh, switching between ReLU, uh, CLU, and these other activation layers, you'll see slight differences. Um, and other components like this, if you remove the res residual uh, connection and the multi-layer perceptron head, um, the accuracy just pretty much goes to zero. Um, where here, this is also just showing that even though they used pooling for this architecture, the architecture does perform better with attention. So here they've switched um, stages three and four. So that's uh, two thirds of the total transformer blocks with attention token mixers. Um, and you can see a multiple percentage increase in performance um, with only uh, a 25% increase, a little bit over than that in uh, computation that needs to be done and about a third increase in parameters. So that is a key point that even though this paper focuses on the generalization, it's not saying that attention doesn't improve the model. It's just saying that uh, it's not really the key thing you want to focus on when uh, making your architecture. Uh, next, it's SwiftFormer, uh, efficient additive attention for transformer-based real-time mobile vision applications. So in here, it's the introduction of efficient additive attention. It reduces the expensive matrix multiplication operations with an additive approach where the tension and all the other ones was, yeah, it's a matrix multiplication. So when we're dealing with these large um, inputs and just lots of processing because we run many iterations, that expensive uh, operation that is multi matrix multiplication adds up over time. So the key point here, and that's where most of the time will be spent on, is talking about how uh, this reduction occurs. So yeah, so as we remind ourselves, Attention scores are computed by taking the soft max of two matrices, uh, Q and K with D dimensions. Um, and so the time complexity of that is uh, N squared times the dimension size. Um, but if we transpose Q instead of K, um, then that complexity goes uh, to D squared, like N times D squared instead of uh, N squared times D. Uh, and Q, K, and V are the three different um, matrices used in the transformers. It's the keys, the values, and the query. Um, so the first way that attention has been improved is through this separable self-attention. So given um, K queries, uh, key, or K keys and V values, we encode them element-wise. So rather than encoding them matrix-wise, if we're encoding the elements, uh, because this thing scales non-linearly, it'll perform faster. So first to do this, we project the query matrix Q into N by one vector Q, apply the softmax to create context scores. Uh, we multiply context scores by the uh, matrix K and pool to create a context vector S. Element-wise multiplication between S and V return the attention scores. So instead of just multiplying these two matrix, we have a summation of a bunch of smaller multiplications. Next is efficient additive attention. As we saw, traditionally attention depends on three components. What if we um, remove this key value interaction um, during the encoding? That's what a efficient additive attention is. So the model rather retains that interaction um, through uh, linear projection layer. So now the model only depends on two matrices, uh, Q and K. So how does this do it? Um, first, it's, it creates this global attention 
query vector. So we're going to let alpha represent this uh, query vector where the weights um, like W subscript A is a learnable parameter for the attention weights. And we calculate this query vector by multiplying the uh, query matrix by this uh, weights parameter, which is divided by the square root of the dimensions. And now we're going to make a global query vector. So before this was like our attention scores, we're going to create this global query vector by multiplying element wise. Um, or sorry, we pool the learned attention with the query matrix to create Q, the global query vector, um, which it's this is saying is the summation of the uh, element wise multiplication of the two vectors, or the attention vector multiplied by the query vector, or query matrix. And then uh, efficient additive attention output. Um, it's performed element. Uh, wise multiplication between the key matrix K and global query vector Q. So time complexity is N by D for this step rather than N squared by D or um, N by D squared. Um, and so two, you perform the linear transformation T. This is how we retain that missing matrix that we didn't include. And then we add a normalized query matrix um, Q hat. So what this is doing is we've taken the E matrix and multiplied by this global query vector. And because it's a vector, it will multiply um, faster than another matrix. And then we do the linear transformation to learn that missing interaction on that. And then we add that as a term um, to the query matrix because we've included in that linear transformation the impact of the value um, to the overall system. Uh, so now here's a more visual approach of these different uh, um, methods that I described earlier. So first is the general self-attention. It's the three matrix, uh, transpose one, um, multiply the two together, and then run a softmax. Um, and then multiply it by the values, and then use your linear layer to create your output. Uh, separable self-attention is uh, the element wise on the Q matrix, then do the multiplication, then pool them, and then multiply by the values. Um, the efficient additive attention is you include the attention step in that element wise vector. Um, then you're just summing them and then you're multiplying by k um, and doing that transformation and, uh, and also including a normalization. So um, if we look at the um, complexity of each, self-attention is usually spatial dimensions on spatial dimensions and it's n by n. Um, transpose attention uses on feature dimensions and it's d by d. Uh, and then separable uses the element wise operations to improve efficiency and efficient uh, additive attention. It takes it a step further with smaller operations being summed. Um, so the Swift Porter encoder is like, yeah, so we've talked about like how the attention scores are calculated and how um, and how the transformer learns. But now we want to talk about the general architecture. Similar to the previous paper, it follows this four stages um, where the model is decreasing at the same rate uh, size of the input image um, by four, then by eight, then by 16, by 32. Um, and you feed it into the convolutional encoder, then you feed it into a swift uh, former block, and then you downsample it by two. Um, and then you just repeat for those four stages. Um, each of the Swift former encoders uh, has this local representation, which is by the depth-wise convolution, is the three by three convolution, then a one by one convolution. Then we take that efficient additive attention layer that we explained earlier. Then we have our linear transformation, and each convolution encoder is the depth-wise convolution, normalization, uh, one by one convolution, the activation layer, which is the GILU, and the convo. Um, so here are the results. Uh, 
So Swiftformer is a hybrid between the compilation and tran transformers. And it has um, less parameters um, than most, than some of the other hybrid approaches, but it has better accuracy um, and it has a lower latency. And in this case, I don't see the latency being the biggest issue just in general practice because we're talking in milliseconds. So in any performance setting um, uh, prediction, if you're doing something in real time, it just has to be like 60 frames a second, I think is like the minimum. And so anything like realistically under a latency of 10 milliseconds is going to achieve that goal. Um, the bigger thing is the throughput. Um, it, perform it has a better throughput than all of the other hybrid approaches. Um, uh, not necessarily in all the other transformer ones, but all the other hybrids in most cases um and the throughput here is just your training speed so it trains faster um and so even though it has less operations that it has to do um if the throughput is like slower like for instance in uh dit uh dash t um in the second block there it has a higher throughput even though it has um more um computations that it has to do so like in that case um you're still going to spend a longer time training even though it is technically faster just do that it likely has to train more times or more epochs but you will get a better result with uh swift form Um, next, it's uh, detection and image segmentation. So similar to the last paper, um, these uh, detection in instance segmentations are based on uh, bounding boxes um, on different thresholds and also masks on different thresholds. And uh, Swiftformer performs the best out of all of them. And then they also do on, for the semantic, it's the intersection over union, um, which was the same metric described earlier. Thank you.